congratulations. Thank you. On this very fine piece of work to you and your supervisors. It's a very great privilege and a pleasure to have been invited to discuss it with you. And uh, I have some uh, four questions, roughly, give and take, but four areas that I would like to discuss. Um, but first, before presenting what they are, I would like to um, just tell you that my impression is that this is STS at, it, at its best, actually. Oh, great. Yes. So I thought I should start there uh, to say that this, for Thank me, you. is uh, actually what we're doing. It's You had a very nice... Mm, your own narrative about the transversal resonates very well with how I see it. So we have engineers, programmers, physicists uh, in the past uh, and uh, people from various disciplines uh, coming together from the social sciences, anthropology, um, to tinker and experiment and strategize and develop mm. stuff, right? So that we can engage with our common world of science and technology. So um, I also remember very vividly your irritation <laughs> at the PhD course that you referred to uh, and your work of making sense of stuff. And I think that kind of irritation is a very important fuel. So the irritation that you got from some social scientists and the irritation that some scientists, social scientists will get mm -hmm. from you, you know, so it much goes fewer. both ways. So, <laughs> so uh, that's appreciated, I think, that um, that part. Now, the four areas, I mean, data and networks, that's a yes and no question. It's just to get started. So I'll start with a yes and no question. Okay. Yes. And then we have a longer question about situatedness and situating, and then uh, something about algorithms, and then the politics of technology. Okay. Okay. So the yes and no question, it goes like this. Um, is the nature of data that data is relational? Is the question, are all data relational? Yes. No. 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 Okay. No. You want, you, I mean, you want an explanation or is it just yeah. a, okay. That's the first one. We can get <laughs> oh, you say to... it's a yes or no question. I'll play the game. Okay. Yeah. Um, if all data is relational, then the word has no meaning, right? So, and then, I mean, you can see relations everywhere, but I think that at the core, there are other types of data that is important to just assume, for instance, temporal data. I don't think that uh, a series of uh, numbers over time, I don't think it's really relational. If we want to see that relational, then everything is relational and it's not interesting. Now, where you're right is that many data are implicitly relational. So it's, it's not, it's not, relational is not a quality, it's not an essential quality. It depends on your ability to see relations. Doesn't mean that you can see relations everywhere, but still that's a lot of things you, you could see as relational. That's a very nice answer. And, and uh, our networks, uh, visual networks, part of what helps us see them as relational? Yes, for, in, I mean, the right way or also in a misleading way, but it does. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it true that we can sometimes be misled by the networks? Sure. I would, I would say it um, positively. You will tend to, to understand as network things we, we can see as network, and when I say see, we can visualize as networks, and this has, I mean, some things we, we have a hard time seeing as networks, we tend to see them as not net networks, although they might be, and also things that are not really networks, if we can visualize them as networks, then we may think of them as networks, even if it's not the right thing to do. Okay, so how do we know if it makes sense to... I, mean, I don't want to step in the normative territory. It depends on who you are, what you want to achieve. But you can have internal ways to understand that your ways of analyzing things do not work. Mm -hmm. Right. We'll get back to that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my second uh, question here is, um, you know, it's on a more, let's say, critical note. Because um, Lucy Suchman has explained uh, once in a workshop that social context tends to have the shape of a middle-sized pumpkin. 
Mm. So we have a tendency to bound it, right? Yeah. But when I read your work, I felt a little bit that you did the same with situation and situating yeah. so that, uh, which is not how I read heroin. Mm. So we'll discuss heroin a little bit and then sure. your uh, rendering of it. So as I read her uh, situated knowledge, is, which you also explained, is opposed to a macro perspective on the world. And I have to say, to be fair to you, that you had a very nice sentence in your presentation about uh, si situating as the capacity to re-examine our relation to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that was spot on and really beautiful, I think. So this explains that it's not about a global perspective and a local perspective, but about like how things are related, but very much in relation to knowledge and the tools, the scientific tools we use. So you use Haraway to argue that situations matter, but to you, a situation seems more bounded than actually ex extended in time and space. That's how I read you anyway. You can object in a minute. So a situation seems to be characterized by the possibility of establishing a context, like the possibility of reading a network in a particular situation. And I would like to think with you about other possibilities that are, I think are more in line with how uh, Haraway writes about it, for example, in this book, Staying mm. with the Trouble. Um, and I think you are on your way there, because on page 128, you say, the algorithm can teach us something. You talk about seeing the world from the perspective of the algorithm. And this is the kind of curious practice that she writes uh, about in the chapter, a curious practice, which ends like this. She talks a lot about critters, uh, these animals. Mm. So yes. Things, right? um, that can be both animals and things. And I think your algorithm is actually a critter. So if you think about algorithms as critters, um, think about it this way. Uh, neither the critters nor the people could have existed or could endure without each other in ongoing curious practices. Attached to ongoing pasts, they bring each other forward in thick presents and still possible futures. They stay with the trouble in speculative fabulation. So what I would like to hang on to is this attached to ongoing pasts, they bring each other forward in thick presents and still possible futures. And it's that sense that I would like to hear your reaction on, because I think um, it points to a version of situatedness that talks about various attachments to your critters, your scientific tools, um, your te techno-scientific tools. Um, and, and it's not really about you, and your situatedness, but it's really about how to make um, situated knowledges, right, in this mess of past, futures, uh, possibilities, and so on. So I wondered if you could reflect on how the statement, the algorithm can teach us something, is true in the context of situated knowledges, or how that resonates with you, if, if it does. Hmm. Okay, so I, I think that the question you ask is a lot about, the, about boundaries. For instance, the boundaries around us and the boundaries around the algorithm and um, the way we are or not entangled. I think that in the ANT or just the STS perspective here, um, if you look closely enough, you see that we are entangled with the algorithm. Because first of all, the algorithm is, a, it, by nature, I think it's a poorly bounded object uh, for many reasons. But one of them is that it exists under multiple forms. Uh, and Marimol would say it's more than one, but less than many. It's in papers, and it's also implementations. And implementations are really, really like they are described in papers. Um, but also they may exist under <laughs> a family of implementation that are not completely different, but in a Wittgenstein way, they have a family air, you know, they are connected in, in a loose way. So 
Of course, the algorithm is, is not completely bounded uh, that way. And also us, who is us? Is it the users? And then the users does not, do not exist when it comes to the algorithm in isolation from the situations where they use them. And then if we look closely enough, they have different goals. So at least we should distinguish probably between different uses people expect from the algorithm, different situations where different things arise. So the boundaries will explode when we look closely enough. And, and I think that it's still... When we look closely enough. Yeah. Which assumes that there's somebody looking at it. Yeah, closely enough, I just want here that uh, in terms of the kind of narratives we produce, I think we can come up, and it's not just us now, so people who... That's exactly yeah. what I'm after. yes. So it's, it's not that, because we can only do that if we're outside of it. But it, what, did, what was... Uh, also when we're inside, yeah. because people come up with narratives about what the algorithm does for its users. Mm -hmm. And here, when I say that, it's in the narrative itself, the agents, the narrated agents, are the algorithm and the users. Uh, that's the way, for instance, algorithm designers will um, narrate their algorithm in their papers. So there are narratives about the algorithm as an object and, and the users as people. Now, maybe they're right. Maybe these boundaries exist. I don't want to presume, but I think that when you go the SDAS way, you realize that most of the time, when you look the the material and semiotic properties of the algorithm in the way it exists, it doesn't work less like the narrative that is in the paper. That's what I mean by in detail. So yeah. with, that in, with that in mind, what would you like? To, you, you talked in your lecture about the situating moves as mm. something you could offer to other tool makers. That's yes. something they need to be aware of. So how does this... You know, so I have no... I think that there is a repertoire of okay. situating moves. Mm -hmm. And I, I strongly believe that um, the language of STS is offensive to a certain kind of people, especially among the computer scientists and algorithm designers, not all of them. Mm -hmm. But and, I mean, when I just published the manuscript of the thesis on Twitter, I had a nice exchange with Thiago Peixoto, who wrote a number of algorithms that I talk about in the, and he was triggered when I said that, when I criticized what I call the rhetoric of extraction, the idea that if you say that the groups have been extracted from the data, then you imply that there were pre-existing the process, while I say actually they have been produced by the process. This is extremely, he like, yeah. We reached that point where constructivists and realists can't talk anymore. That's it. Yeah. But I, I also believe uh, strongly enough in STS that you don't need to rely on that kind of... I think that this language is intended for other STS scholars. Mm -hmm. I know that a, a lot of people have used this language in STS papers, and they conceive it as an intervention. But if your public is not other STS people, but this kind of public, I think it's better to do it the other way because like, we know that uh, realities are practiced into existence, but that's something you can't tell to those, but you can still practice other realities into existence with them. And that's why sometimes it's better to stick to, use, to words like the algorithm, us. Uh, I think that the, the thesis is, is written as in a STS spirit, but with, to a large extent, a non-STS uh, audience. That's why I also want to acknowledge that I also come from that from that place, so sometimes it's a mistake on my side or that's a process in me into changing my perspective, but I, I, I still hold on that ground. So what do you think about uh, thinking of algorithms as living creatures and, 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 and speaking of it in terms of life hmm? uh, can be, you know, biographies, but it could also be like alien life forms yeah. or because I think a lot of what you and that is the yeah. third thing I wanted to ask you, it's about um, you know, Bernard uh, in our pre-meeting he helped me frame this question a little bit, he said that you wrote uh, that we can understand gravity but we cannot understand how like sand falls in a shape of pyramid, mm. we can observe yeah. it, but we cannot explain it in yeah. the same terms. Yeah, it's not in the laws. Yeah. So, yeah. 
if 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 networks are sort of alien creatures as mm -hmm. well, and how they form themselves and are formed, and you know all what you've explained uh, so far, if that also kind of resists understanding, uh, yeah, which you seem to yeah. imply, right? Indeed. So could we could a situating move also be talking be to talk more about life, life in the networks or the life of data or like the human interpreters together with the data and the algorithms and the visual networks and what you explained so nicely about how we see things with our hmm. eyes without actually computing it. <laughs> so when you talked about seeing, it's not believing. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered if that is also a kind of situating move or how like life or vitality is, is that something that is discussed? Yeah. Now? If that would go down better, so, so to speak, then this kind, of, this kind of text also doesn't. I would like to take the, I think that there is a compatibility with the highway style and also the practice of even hard science. I want to say first that when you say algorithms are like life, um, it's a metaphor. I know they are not really alive. Or if they are alive, I would like to say to which extent, and there are definitions of life that would not apply. Mm -hmm. But I think that then that's completely up to you and it's a rhetorical, rhetorical you. What do you think is the purpose of, let's say, science? And I think that being fruitful is what I would put on the top because it's all about curiosity. So rather than being exact, I would rather be uh, fertile. And then I would really much go this way because saying that algorithms are alive allows you to engage with uh, a multiplicity, um, a continuum of variations that you would more easily attribute to living things than these supposedly inert pieces of code. And of course, if you switch your perspective, then you, you may start, it may help you understand that um, algorithms exist under many forms and they, uh, so they don't mutate in a, in a very naive sense. But what would the consequence be? Yeah. I mean, so I don't analytically, know. I don't, I don't think know. it's a metaphor that that, that is so but, helpful, I mean, but, but I think analytical as a, con, as a concept. So, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the metaphor performs, it, it does things, so it changes your perspective. And, but I, I don't know, so I have no answer on what would that do. So I agree that it's a move, I agree that it goes in, it's a STS move, certainly, because it draws some multiplicity into an object that is presumed simple, but it's not. But is it situating? So what's a situating move then? Because it's totally possible that it's a STS move and, and it complicates things, but it doesn't lead to more situatedness in the end. It's not simple for me, but it's just dissolving the boundary between the reader and the network. So it's yeah. to make other uh, flows and connections. Then possible. maybe we could say that when you use an algorithm, you are in a kind of symbiotic relation mm -hmm. where you co-produce with the algorithm. But I mean, we actually have a theory. That's the theory of mediation. But I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. it is indeed. Yeah. So I would really, I mean, absolutely. So the, something I really like is, for instance, saying, because it's clear to everyone that Gephi shifts your goals and you shift the goals of Gephi. And when, for instance, by producing an epistemic surplus in the form of these images that you produce for yourself, but because they exist now, they can become communication assets. And this is shifting your goals in a very uh, material, practical way. And that's just the basic property of the mediation. Another one that I find super interesting is that about black boxing. The black box has to be closed when the mediation is in use, but it can be opened afterwards. And there is a very deep lesson here for instrument designers, which is you cannot have an open black box, but you can facilitate the opening and reclosing. But that's really beautiful. And I think you said about your attachment to tools as tool maker. It was beautifully put because you cannot betray your tool while you are making it. Yeah. You cannot begin to hesitate about what it can do, you really have to... That's another it. connection to life. Close the, the, the black box, yes. otherwise there's and the, nothing. And the black box has a life on its own. I think that maybe it's not that much alive when it's open, at least to you, 
But when it's closed, to the tool maker, I mean, okay, yes, because you see it from the inside. Yeah. But when it's closed, then it's alive in the sense that it's gonna have a trajectory that you didn't imagine because the way it's intertwined with the users goes in directions that you can't anticipate. Which leads me to the final issue. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think we're good with time. Okay. Uh, so it's about the practical implementation of visualization tools. Um, so my entrance into it is about my own research in public sector digitalization in Denmark, where uh, algorithms in the broadest possible understanding of the word and automated decision making uh, is happening in municipalities, for example, to assess what kind of welfare services people can have. And some of the tools that are in use right now is like a traffic light. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's in a way a, a sort of data visualization. It doesn't show the network, but some of the traffic lights are also transported into data net, uh, network maps. Mm -hmm with clusters. Mm -hmm. So I'm super interested to hear from you um, around the reading of such tools. What would you do, I mean, if you would be asked to, to teach reading skills, let's say, or, what, or what, do, what kind of skills do you think are needed? Because I think you're guarding us against the, I mean, even though I like you say you're an instrumentalist, you're definitely guarding us a warning against an instrumentalist approach <laughs> to these things, right? In a, as a flat world. So you, what you're speaking about just now about mediation is really about, and, and what our discussion about life, and it's really about not just taking it at face value. So yeah. at, on the other hand, in the practice, I think, it's all about taking it at face value. So it's really about, yeah. So could you comment on that and then maybe we can discuss politics. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so what are you talking about utilitarian it? uses of visualizations? How do you understand <laughs> that? That's, okay. I, don't, I, don't really, I don't really know, but I think that some people have a utilitarian perspective, and I was wondering with visualization. Thinking about um, uh, case workers who don't know about statistics mm. uh, being tasked to decide on the basis of uh, data visualization mm. that they're not familiar with. So this is something they have to do. And let's say you were invited to help them in some way, or maybe their managers is a better, you know, to sort yeah. of help them understand something about this practice. Uh, you know, you can comment yeah. on what, what comes to your mind. It's an open question. What comes to my mind first is that the, the first way I would teach someone this kind of visualizations, but maybe even many other kinds of visualization is by showing how they work. Because I think that there is, there are, some obvious but not necessarily visible material semiotic properties of the visualizations that are understood in a very intuitive way if you see how it unfolds, for instance. So for instance, if you see a network specialize itself, but there are other ways. Like if, you, if it's clear for you the way the visualization was constructed, then it really helps you understand what's at play. But it's much more complicated to explain that with words than to kind of play it using visual media. Now, um, people who do data visualization have the tools to go extremely far away in that direction because like Tableau does that, D3.js uh, equips uh, a lot of tinkerers like at the border of design and coding. And so to produce moving visualizations that are not just because it's temporal data, but just because it helps you understand where it comes from or articulate different views, for instance. But of course, doing that requires an investment. So yeah. then I would put the blame on the situation. And by that, I mean, we, you have just the final result. You're supposed to read it in a very short time. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And it's been crafted to, in some way, that's what I could a utilitarian use. Mm. You get the, on the premise that information is like a, a, a thing that's in that and that we transport. And that's absolutely not what information is or knowledge. We could make a difference between information and knowledge, but none of them are like a thing that's in there and that we move. Of course. Yeah. So it's a literacy, of course. I, I don't see, I see no shortcut through the literacy. Ways to make it easier, but. Okay. Yeah, politics now. Yes, and data, <laughs> because um, what I've seen in my field work is that there's a slippery slope between data as fact and data as relation. Mm. And people switch the whole time. So I agree with your first comment that data is not relation. I mean, and, but I see it as an anthropologist. Yeah, okay. Practice, right? So they both treat it and done as facts, as evidence, as self-contained, uh, you know, as truths in them and by themselves. But all the time when that is happening, people tend to say, oh, but you have to remember that you've got to relate to data to understand them. And what does this category mean and yeah. so on and so forth? So I think it calls for the equivalent of the notion of immutable mobile for the data. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not so sure it's immutable. I'm not so sure it's mobile. Of course, it can circulate, but in ways that are so different from images that we cannot just take immutable mobile from Latour and stick it to data, but there's still something very similar at play. So the way data uh, exists in a material way in our, in our environment, it has a number of effects that are very interesting. And of course, there is a way to describe that in the politics of methods. I mean, what we do with visualization, we could also do that as for the data. Now, data becomes a tricky concept if you do that, because we, I think we immediately we need to make the distinction between, for instance, files, which is something well-defined in our digital infrastructures, and things that are data but that are not files. And then you may retrieve things like flows, fluxes. This is also quite well-defined, but there are also other things than that. And so it's more complicated than just images. But we could take a case and we could follow the life of the data and its transformations and it's also its multiplication. And then we would see that it enacts not only because of what's supposedly inside, but it creates ripple around it that diffract in many, many different directions. And by itself, we could engage with that without even looking what's inside the data. Exactly, yes. Totally agree. So, so on the politics, I think I wrote something. Um, yes, I, I like, yes, let's go back to the tool maker and our relation with scientific instruments and knowledge because you talk about knowing the limitation of the mediation as well as its power. Mm. So maybe we should connect that to the complex so scape. Yeah. Oh. So wh what is the, I mean, okay, I, I'm not sure I have a very clever question, but it, it will be something about, you know, that we have a great tendency, I have as social scientists, part of the social sciences, to have a great faith in humans and humans' learning capacity mm. to navigate in such a complex escape. But you seem to come from it from a different angle yeah. where you're not, I mean, you're, you're a little bit uh, tired of the users uh, quite often, I think, in your writing. You're, you're a little uh, skeptical that they can do a lot. We are mutually irritated, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so you don't have that great faith in humans. So how would you, you know, in the as so, a final comment here, yeah. um, what what must a good complex escape look like for the humans not to get lost? Okay, so I I don't know, but there's something else that is worth saying about the faith in the human being and what it plays here. I think that we strongly underestimate how much we believe in the way we construct the, the data world around us. We, we, strongly, we make as if we enact a world where the, there is no limit to our ability to understand. So there is always kind of the naive 
hope or perspective that we'll find the right view to get it. That if we don't get it, that's just because we didn't find the right view and maybe it's, it needs two views, right? But at some point, we're facing that moment where we have to admit that there are things that are beyond our, our understanding. That's worth saying, because if you realize that, then you realize that the world where you have, that you have your whole life as a civilization or whatever, as, as the huge infrastructure of science has always looked under the light for the keys and never outside our ability to understand. So a lot of things we think as absolute are in fact relative. And the complexoscape is us starting to realize that. But I think the, the way beyond that is to find alternative strategies to cope with our inability to understand a number of things. And when I say inability, like definitive inability, there, there, there are things coming that no one will be able to understand. So how do we deal? We should draw inspiration from people like, I don't know, Forrest Gump. What does it make to be dumb and to know it? I think that's a good model for the human being. <laughs> that's it. And that's it. Uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks.